Hello, saints. Peace, love, grace of Christ Jesus be with all of you. I hope everyone is doing fantastic today. We just finished up our first five chapters of our study on the book of Acts. And what we've seen so far is the ascension of our Lord Jesus, the creation of the little flock, the believing Jews under the 12 apostles. And this little flock is literally thinking that they're in the last days. They're expecting the Antichrist to come to power at any point. The 12 apostles have been given miraculous powers by the Holy Spirit to enable them with the ability to speak in many languages, to heal the sick, to perform signs and wonders all throughout Jerusalem. We talked about why this power has been given to the apostles. And it's for basically two different reasons. The first reason, it is a sign to the Jews that Jesus Christ was in fact who he said he was, their Messiah. Second, this power that's given to the apostles will be needed to keep the little flock alive and well and healthy so they can sidestep the Antichrist and endure till the end of Daniel's 70th week. God is going to provide them with food, with water, with clothing, all the necessities they will need during this time of trouble. Unbelievers, on the other hand, who will be able to stay alive during Daniel's 70th week, able to work, buy food, and so on, are those people who take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist as God. But they're going to lose both their lives and their souls within those seven years. They're going to be deceived by the Antichrist, all because they refuse to believe in the first place. They will fall away through this apostasy. So we see here that the little flock, God's people, will have, they're going to need supernatural protection and provisions and God's going to provide for those seven years otherwise they're going to starve to death or they're going to die from sickness and pestilence and diseases and wars and earthquakes the scorching Sun freezing winters and so on now in this next chapter chapter 6 we're introduced for the very first time a very important person the pivot point for the nation of Israel they don't know it, but Stephen will change the world. And Stephen will also change the administration from kingdom to grace. We're still in the kingdom program at this point. Paul hasn't been converted. In fact, Paul is going to help them kill Stephen. But there is no body of Christ yet. There is no dispensation of grace yet. As far as Israel is concerned, they're heading head first into the prophesied week of Daniel, the day of the Lord. Now, let us look at chapter 6 as we move closer to the stoning of the prophet Stephen. In Acts 6 verse 1, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now a couple things here. Keep in mind, by this point, this point in time, there's literally ten thousands of thousands and tens of thousands of Jews who are believing at this point. The little flock. The little flock isn't so little right now. The twelve tribes are scattered all throughout the Mediterranean, all throughout Rome and Greece and Asia and Macedonia and Galatia and Syria and so on. Secondly, we're introduced to the Grecians. Now, who are these Grecians? If you look at the Easton's Bible Dictionary, the Grecians are Hellenists. They're Greek Jews. Jews born in a foreign country. They didn't speak Hebrew, nor join in the Hebrew services of the Jews in Palestine, but had synagogues of their own in Jerusalem. So the Grecians are Greek-speaking Jews. 
And this can happen by several different ways. One way, they could be Jews who were born in Greece or in a different area. They grew up speaking Greek, having Greek customs. And another way, they could, they could have been a young Jewish child who moved away from Jerusalem to a different area in Greece and so on with their families and learned the Greek language at a very young age instead of their native Hebrew tongue. So the Grecians are not Gentiles. They're not Greek Gentiles. Grecians are Greek speaking Jews, okay? And they were upset because they were being treated differently. There was prejudice because they spoke Greek instead of Hebrew. They had customs that the Hebrews weren't familiar with. They were different. Perhaps they even acted different, much different than the Hebrews in Jerusalem. And the Hebrews were looking down on them and neglecting to provide them with essentials, the food, the water, shelter, alms, and so on. In verse 2, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Now a proselyte is a Gentile who converts to Judaism. They get circumcised. They follow all the same laws and rules that the Jews did under the Mosaic system, the dispensation of law. And notice what Luke says about Stephen and not the others. Luke says, Stephen was full of faith and filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. We're being given some important clues here. In verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. In the next verse, notice again how Luke makes Stephen stand out from the rest here. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Luke is going out of his way here to make sure the reader knows that Stephen was extraordinary in faith and in power. He stood out from the rest. Verse 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Okay, so who is the synagogue of the Libertines? The word Libertine means to be set free, as in once being a slave and then being set free. They were liberated, but had deep-seated psychological wounds because of their past enslavements. This went back generations upon generations upon generations. They'd been slaves for a very long period of time throughout history. And these libertines didn't like what Stephen was preaching. And they were arguing with Stephen. Verse 10, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now, it's important to remember what Luke told us earlier concerning Stephen. Luke said Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. That's the reason why these libertines are having a hard time arguing with Stephen. We're told in the book of Luke what the Holy Spirit would do during the last days. Look at Luke 21 verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. 
delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. This is Jesus speaking to the Jewish believers here. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. Now look at this next verse. Here's the answer here. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. The Holy Spirit was speaking directly through Stephen and was confounding even the wise libertines here. They were perplexed at the wisdom coming from Stephen's mouth because it was God speaking through Stephen. They didn't, they, they didn't stand a chance. Verse 11, Then they stubborn men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. The word stubborn means to pay someone to give a false testimony, to bribe someone with money. So these libertines bought off a group of Jews to give false testimony about Stephen, trying to destroy his credibility so no one would believe anything he said. It still goes on today. We have a bunch of libertines in our own government, stubborning people around them. To climb the political ladder the same wicked heart no matter what millennium we're in and it's it's only gonna get worse as we get closer to the day of the Lord in verse 12 and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council speaking of Stephen and set up false witnesses which said this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Libertines loved the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. All these things being said about Stephen were lies designed to destroy his credibility. Now once again, the work of demons trying to destroy God's children, corrupting their testimonies, making their testimonies nothing by attacking their character and even bringing up their past. And the list goes on and on and on. Verse 15, And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So the enemy is attacking Stephen. What is it about Stephen that's so important? Why him? Why Stephen? Well, there's a very, very good reason why the enemy hates Stephen. But you're going to have to wait till the next study in chapter 7 to find out. Everything changes in chapter 7, a very important chapter in the book of Acts. And we're going to meet our apostle for the very first time, Saul, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee, a very well-educated religious Jew, all comes in the next study. Now in closing, have you ever wondered why or how they determined the order of the books in the King James Version Bible? If you look at it, it's not organized chronologically as they were written. It's not organized alphabetically. So how is it organized? How is the King James Version Bible organized? It really doesn't make sense unless you know the secret. The reason why most people don't know how or how they decided to organize the King James Version Bible is because they were never taught how to rightly divide. They were never taught anything about dispensations or administrations. Let me explain. Now that you have some idea of right division and dispensations, now you'll know why they organized the King James Version Bible the way they did. Notice, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are all about time past, the dispensation of law. Then, you have the book of Acts, the transition from law to a possible coming kingdom to grace, from Peter to Paul, from kingdom 
to grace. Then once the dispensation is fully in Paul's hands, the dispensation of grace and the transition from the little flock to the body of Christ has been made complete over 30 plus years, we have our books, Paul's 13 books of grace for today. Then when Paul's books end at Philemon and this dispensation ends at the rapture, we have what books? Well, after Paul, after the rapture, the dispensation of grace ends. The rapture happens. Next is the ages to come. The continuation of the kingdom gospel. The last days once again. Daniel's 70th week is in the picture once again. A continuation from Peter's little flock once the body of Christ leaves. Hebrews through Revelation. All about Israel once again. The ushering in of the earthly kingdom the last days leading up to Jacob's trouble and then our Lord's glorious re return so you see even the King James Version Bible is designed according to the administrations or dispensations of time time of periods of different groups of people this is no coincidence the people who put the King James Version Bible together were dispensationalists it's nothing new don't let the enemy steal the truth from you Saints He's working overtime right now to take this truth from you. So someone has been trying hard to hide this fact that the Bible is organized accordingly. Isn't that interesting? You're not going to get caught, you know, you're not going to get taught that in today's denominational churches who are trying to put you in other people's programs and dispensations and administrations. They won't show you the truth because if they did, you'd be able to see that their teachings just don't add up. They don't follow the flow of the Bible. Their teachings would crash to the ground. It's just something for you to think about as we close. Peace, grace, and love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. Lord willing, I'll see you for chapter 7.